Welcome to Inspiring Heartfelt Conversations. My name is Barbara Morningstar. This series is presented by In Autumn's, In Autumn's Cocoon, which offers education on a range of end-of-life topics in the form of talks, workshops, and courses. For more information, you can go to inautumnscocoon.com. Today, my guest is Dr. Pippa Hawley. Dr. Hawley founded the Supportive and Palliative Care Service at British Columbia's Cancer Program in 1997 and remains its medical director. Along with Gaby Iryu, she co-authored Lap of Honor, A No-Fear Guide to Living Well with Dying, which we will be referring to in this conversation. Welcome, Dr. Hawley. Thanks very much, Barbara. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, if I could just let people know where I am, um, I'm sitting in my home office looking out at the beautiful North Shore Mountains, just visible through the cloud. Um, and I'm on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Squamish Nation, where I live. Thank you for that. In honor of the land that we both are blessed to live on, right? Mm -hmm. So live and thrive. Yes, absolutely. So today we will explore what palliative care really means how to access services, and many of the practical elements one faces in end-of-life care. But I, I want to start by the title of the book. Why did you choose Lap of Honor? Actually, that was um, Peter Eru's idea, um, Gaby's husband. Okay. Um, and uh, in uh, what, what we were trying to do is have something that was really positive to make people associate the end of life with a sense of completion and uh, a, something that had been achieved and a lap of honor, or in North American terms, um, often called a, excuse me, <coughs> called a victory lap. Mm. Victory lap, lap of honor is the same thing. Um, and uh, because we are trying to uh, serve uh, an international audience, not just North America, and even though we're both working in, in North America at the moment, uh, we both have very strong roots, both in the UK and in Australasia. Um, we felt that uh, Lap of Honor would would be sufficiently understood by the majority of the world, rather than Victory Lap. That's beautiful, actually, and and a and a lovely note to lead into this conversation. So, mm -hmm. so the word palliative care brings up a lot of different um, images for people. Could you start by just giving us? sort of a definition for the audience of what palliative care means? Well, if people want to look up the, the official definition, they can Google the WHO definition, the World Health Organization. Um, but it's quite long, and I, I can paraphrase it to you. Um, there's lots of different ways of, um, of, like, different depths of the definition. Some definitions include all the components that make up palliative care, and some a bit, are a bit more sort of broad. But the basic theme is medical care, which is directed at improving the quality of patients' lives and that of their families, whatever the family means. Um, and uh, the, the big difference from 2013 onwards with the WHO definition, and which I'm very much embracing and trying to, to, to share and spread, is the concept that uh, it's life-threatening illnesses or serious chronic illnesses that make people um, appropriate for having a palliative approach to care rather than life-limiting, which is what it used to be before 2013. Uh, what was happening before 2013 is that people were only thinking of palliative care for when people were right at the very end of life. So people were getting perhaps in some cases too little, but definitely too late. Whereas what we have shown repeatedly in studies is that early access to palliative care actually requires, it requires time in order to make the most of the interventions that are available. So early access to palliative care means that you have to have uh, awareness of palliative care principles when people are diagnosed with a life-threatening illness, even if they might ultimately survive it and be cured. Mm -hmm. Well, you're known for what you call the bow, called the bow tie model, which has this expansive element in the tie itself. So why then do you want to elaborate more on why you picked the image of a bow tie? Well, the, um, the, the image just created itself, really. Um, 
I mean, I, I'm not sure I could do this on the video, but I could, <laughs> if I had a, a, a whiteboard or something, I could draw it. But if you can just imagine um, in your in your vision what it would look like, the old original model for a palette of K was like a big rectangle, mm. like a two by four, mm. and with a beginning and an end. Um, and when you start in the model, going from left to right, because that's the way we read, left to right, it starts with disease modifying treatment. So cure, 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 cure. And there's, you go through the illness, surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, blood pressure pills, dialysis, whatever, um, liver treatment. And then there's a point where somebody says, it ain't working. Mm. You're going to die from this. Mm -hmm. The grim reaper appears. Mm -hmm. And then the focus of care transitions from one, at one point in time to focus on quality of life and end of life care. And for many people, what happened is you'd have that much in your life uh, from the time of diagnosis and that much of it, you were accessing palliative care. Mm -hmm. okay? So that was the old model. The next model, which was a significant advance, was the same log, but split into two triangles diagonally. So mm -hmm. from the beginning of the journey, living with illness, the focus was primarily on trying to cure it. But as time goes by, the possibility of cure gets less and less and less as mm -hmm. things are not going well. And consequently, the other triangle above it is palliative care, and that gradually increases. So there was an, uh, the idea of an integration between a palliative and the disease-modifying approach to care. But it was still a hard endpoint. Mm. There was no exit route from this model other mm. than in a box. Mm. Okay? So it didn't actually make any difference to the point at which people engaged with palliative care. People still had this idea that palliative care, palliative care was only for the dying. Mm -hmm. And people will say, well, that's all very well for people that are dying, but I'm not dying. Mm -hmm. Just, I mean, yes, I've had metastatic breast cancer for 12 years, but I'm not dying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or yes, I know I've had five heart attacks, but you know, I'm not dead yet. Mm -hmm. So they just didn't engage with the model. So the idea with, with the bow tie model is you take that triangle one, that there's that, that second model, and basically just add survivorship mm -hmm. by adding an inverse on the top. So just as the outcome could be hospice and end-of-life care, the outcome could equally be survivorship. Mm -hmm. Now, in real life, the, the chances of survivorship or dying may not be 50%. They may be 90% in favor of survivorship, like mm -hmm. a small early heart attack, mm -hmm. like in your 40s. You mm -hmm. know? get a stent, you get your anticoagulation, you get put on blood pressure pills. But for some people, that small heart attack in their 40s, you drop dead. Mm -hmm. And, you, and that, so there is a small chance that somebody might die of that. Whereas um, in other conditions, it's more likely, uh, like somebody's diagnosed with advanced metastatic lung cancer. You know, at the moment, we don't think we have a cure for that, but there are new oncology treatments coming along all the time. And if that particular lung cancer tumor cell has a specific mutation which uh, opens it up to attack by a, a specific drug, a targeted drug, then a patient may go from having advanced metastatic disease to being essentially clinically disease-free in a matter of a few weeks or months with access to the appropriate targeted therapy. So the idea is that you can't, at the beginning of any illness, be 100% certain what the outcome is going to be. Mm -hmm. so, so every patient is living with that dual reality of either getting better or getting worse and dying. And people can flip from one to the other, hour to hour, minute to minute, day to day, month to month. But the fact that both are always present, the idea is that then it introduces people to the fact that they need to obviously hope for the best, but also plan for the rest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of why it. So it ended up looking like two triangles, and two triangles to me just looked like a bow tie. Right. Well, I really appreciate that. You know, because I, I I started before in the professional realm. I started as a volunteer in 1991 at a local mm -hmm. hospice here, and then was on staff. And back then, hospice and palliative care were woven those last mm -hmm. months of life. And even I in the who've been around it are still trying to understand how it weaves together. So we can imagine the person with a diagnosis hearing, well, how does that fit in? And I'm still trying to come to terms with this word showing up 
in mm. my life, right? So, so how do we take it from this word that brings a lot of uncertainty and often fear because it's about, you know, your health changing to turning it into, oh my goodness, you just offered me an amazing gift. Because when we've worked in it and had, my husband died, the palliative care services are amazing. I always say to people, honest to goodness, if you have an illness that's life-threatening, you want the palliative team around you. They are phenomenal people. I know many friends and colleagues who are doctors and nurses, social workers. Their whole goal is to celebrate and have you embrace life and be comfortable. Whole person care, right? All the mm -hmm. dimensions. So how do you help people turn it from this sort of word of uncertainty to see the gift in it? Um, it's probably the most effective way of communicating things that have a sort of existential component is stories. Because mm. uh, it's very hard to choose the right language for any one individual that will sort of penetrate their culture and their lifetime of um, preconceived ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not talking about like, conspiracy theories. I mean, just people <laughs> have exposure to events during their lives and they form their opinions based on their exposure. And if somebody watched a loved one die without access to good quality care, maybe 30 years ago, um, then when they get the same illness, which often happens, then they're going to expect that their course of illness is going to be the same as that one. Because why would you think otherwise? That mm -hmm. doesn't matter what you read in the books. It's I remember Uncle Joe, you know, and this is what happened to him. You know, he had a, I don't know, fatal hemorrhage or, um, you know, or he decided not to have treatment and went off and cycled around the world. And, you know, there's, there's all sorts of different ways that people perceive illness, which is all based on past experience. So if somebody has had negative past experiences or no experiences at all, um, in these days where people move around from one country to another and often very separated from older relatives, um, they may not have much to go on. And so they'll then go for things like what they have seen in the movies or have read in other forms of social media. So essentially what you have to do is try to give them a range of experiences that they can then draw from, which are a bit more balanced. Um, and so we, we talk about examples like um, people, um, when I first came to Canada, I was working in the HIV trials network in uh, Vancouver, which was an absolutely wonderful place to start. I had a wonderful mentor, Dr. Julio Montana, um, who was, was amazing. Uh, but the most amazing thing was meeting the guys because they were mm. mostly gay men, like vast majority were gay men. And they were the most lovely, you know, open, warm, funny, intelligent, just wonderful people. And um, I hadn't really had exposure to that demographic particularly before, you know, my white middle-class background in the South of England and then in New Zealand. I mean, there'd been a little bit of exposure, but not to that extent. And, um, and a lot of them said that getting AIDS was actually a blessing, mm. I, partly because it got them access to care and many of them hadn't had access to good medical care before. Um, they were stigmatized within the healthcare system and they were stigmatized amongst their, um, their social networks. And, and they had their, their, their family was their friends. The gay community was their family. Um, so they, they also felt that many of them had, had focused on the little stuff in life. Um, and when forced to confront your own mortality, it makes you focus more on the big stuff. Mm -hmm. And for many people, they, they, they told me that they didn't feel like they were really living until they had a life-threatening illness diagnosis. And, and later on in, in my work there, it, it became clear that at some point we would have a, a cure. I mean, we do have now, it, it, we have long-term suppressive treatment, which is as good as a cure as anything. Mm -hmm. um, so many of them knew that treatments were coming, um, and, um, but they, they felt that the brush with death that they'd had with the diagnosis was actually uh, a tremendous blessing. And I've had many cancer patients who've said the same thing, uh, people that have been you know, spending seven years at university and then working 14 hours a day in order to save to buy a house and you know, having kids and, and just functioning and not really having much fun at all, you know, two weeks holiday a year. And then when they get this brush with mortality, it forces them to change their priorities and then they start living. Every day becomes a blessing. And every day becomes something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and which is the beauty of, of palliative care and whole person care. It's really more about celebrating life and engaging each moment with um, an intent and an authenticity that you see the gift of each day, right? And mm-hmm. death people, start does to, that. people start to think about their legacy, but not their financial legacy. It becomes less about accumulating stuff and more about accumulating memories and um, having uh, leaving the world a better place than it was when you came into it. Right. So for many people, that they have this existential growth when right. uh, when they're confronted with possibility that their future may be limited, maybe, right. maybe limited, maybe not limited. will be limited. Right. I mean, I mean, maybe we should all be thinking like that. That's one of the benefits, I guess, for those of us that work in this field mm-hmm. is that we're vicariously exposed to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I hope that that we take some of that into our own lives and and try and live like that as well. Like mm-hmm. We should all be thinking of every day being best we could possibly make it, and that we should you know be as kind as we can to all the people around us and um, and try to make sure that if we died tomorrow, I could be struck by lightning, hit by a truck. You know, if today was my last day, would would I be okay with that? Right, exactly. Well, and that's the, that's the beauty. I think in the years that I've done it, as, as you say, um, I've had my, I had a, a health challenge for me that started at 15, which I'm not going to get into all the details of that, but that showed me my vulnerability at a very young age and a journey started, which invited me to go deeper in my life at a young age, because this was always kind of there. And it ended up in a deep healing on so many levels of my life, which mm-hmm. gives me a different sensitivity to what people are going through in this journey. But the gift in what I've seen in celebrating life and whole person care and palliative care over the years has been just so profound and affected me just by being present too. Mm-hmm. So I just want to go back to one little piece before we go into the next part of actually starting on this journey for people um, th- that you kind of talk about in your book, I re- just an example of a friend, a few friends that I've seen lately who might, who are in like a, they have a, a life-threatening diagnosis, they're in their cancer journey, they're struggling through some of the treatments, palliative care has not been brought into the picture, but they're not doing well, like their pain's not managed, or they're still nauseous, and so I remember saying to them, you can access palliative care, you know, and they go, well, I'm not dying. I'm not exactly, going to be, yeah. yeah. And I go, but no, you don't understand. You don't have to be at the end of your life. And, and they go, well, nobody told me about that. My doctor didn't tell me, the oncologist didn't tell me, you know, but you can have a complimentary consult. So how does somebody who isn't at the end of life, even, sometimes even the practitioners around them aren't aware now too of the change diet, um, trajectory for this how do they they invite that conversation in and say can I have a complimentary point of view and team working just, with me just here? ask just ask it's it's not difficult um you can people can talk to their family doctor or nurse practitioner um you know people can ask in all sorts of different ways mm-hmm. um you know tell me about the big picture mm-hmm. um at the moment, I seem to be doing quite well from a medical perspective, but please, can you tell me what's, what might be ahead for me? Right. Um, or, you know, I, I, see, I have lots of concerns about symptoms. Is there anybody I can talk to about them? I mean, palliative care doesn't have to come from a specialist. People, if there's, there's a palliative approach to care, which can be delivered by any healthcare professional. In fact, you know, with the idea of compassionate communities, Good palliative care is probably best delivered by a community because there are so many components to improving people's quality of life, including the you know the physical. Yeah, with physical, we tend to focus on healthcare professionals, but the psychological, the social, and spiritual are mostly delivered by non-healthcare professionals, family, friends, community members. So the um, the important thing is to separate the palliative approach to care, where you access all the components, all the communication, the planning, the the um, the, the spiritual aspects, um, and then there's also the um, the other part of it, uh, which is the specialist. When when the when something is not going well, and all of the usual approaches have been tried, you might need to um, avail yourself of the services of a specialist. And there are specialists in the nursing field, um, specialist palliative care nurses, um, social workers, nutritionists, 
as well as physicians and nurse practitioners. Um, so you don't have to choose to go to a specialist service and from then on never see any of your primary care providers exactly. ever again. Um, you just dip in. And we see a lot of people in our clinic at BC Cancer. We see them once or twice and then sort them out and off they go back to their, their care, care providers. And, and sometimes we see them again a few months later. Sometimes there's a guy I'm seeing um, next week who I last saw him 12 years ago. Mm-hmm. You know? and, and so we dip in when we're needed. And then we step back when we're not needed anymore. And, and that really works well. Once people have had the interaction once and they realize that it's not scary, it's just another doctor who mm-hmm. just has a slightly different approach. Like we're thinking about whole person care and trying to approach uh, people from where they're coming from rather than going in with our own agenda. But once they've experienced that, they say, well, that's, that's, that's great. And now I know I'm good. I can come back anytime. I don't need to come back anymore for a while or maybe mm-hmm. never. And it, it really works well. Well, and I just even another quick and gentle example, my father died close to two years ago in extended care facility back east. And it, it was just as COVID was unfolding. So there were some challenges around it. But mm-hmm. two of two of my close friends are friends of yours and colleagues who are palliative docs. And they were on the phone driving home from work going, Barb, you got to get a palliative consult. Get a palliative consult in there. And I think I hadn't even thought of, after all these years, I hadn't even thought about that. So yeah. we arranged for a consultation to come into the extended care facility. The staff was actually grateful for a yeah. different point of view. So even that, people aren't aware that, and it was just as a compliment that to what was happening for his care mm-hmm. on site, right? Because it was becoming a little more complex. So so the, the goal here is to help people broaden the availability and the true nature of the gift you're offering in palliative care on that whole trajectory, not just, as you mm-hmm. said, in that little piece at the end, right? So. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I think what you've described is also a very common experience is that when people are in an emotionally fraught state, they don't think clearly. Mm. Like smart people don't think clearly (laughs) and similarly just like healthcare professionals should not look after their own family and friends Mm. you don't think clearly you need to be somewhat disengaged Mm. in order to be able to be objective and effective Um, and uh, assuming that just because uh, maybe a family member of a patient is a healthcare provider maybe they're a nurse or care aide or something like that don't assume anything because all logic goes Mm. straight out the window and then people function on gut reactions. Uh, and so it's, it's really important first to recognize that not everybody's thinking clearly when they're under stress. But secondly, also, they'll think a lot clearer if they've had an opportunity to think about these concepts beforehand. Mm-hmm. So this is why I'm trying to encourage health literacy around end of life and living with serious illness uh, and that you don't just kind of wing it as you go. Mm-hmm. You need to plan. Just like if you buy a house, you have to think, what would happen if I died? You know, what would happen to my family? I need life insurance. Mm-hmm. Bing, you go buy life insurance. It doesn't mean you're going to die tomorrow. It's just being sensible. And it's exactly the same with being aware that you might die sometime. Mm-hmm. Like if we have 100% All of us. mortality. We have <laughs> yeah, exactly. mortality. It's going to happen at some point. Mm-hmm. Like one way or the other, we're all going to shift off this mortal coil. And just like you prepare for birth when you get pregnant, you should be spending some small parts of your life as it goes through preparing for the end of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, because t- to not do so is, is just like being an ostrich, you know, putting your head in the sand. Mm-hmm. And the sooner you start, the more likely it is that when it actually happens, you will have done at least some preparation. Mm-hmm. Like, but just starting at the end, you don't have time uh, no. to do everything. So right. it's going to be a shod- shoddy job. And people are going, there's going to be fallout. You mm-hmm. haven't done it properly. You're going to have a higher risk of dysfunctional grief amongst your family and friends. You're mm-hmm. going to have a greater risk of financial um, turmoil, conflict between relatives, and um, a lot of regret and trauma, traumatization of your loved ones. Mm-hmm. If you've not done a good job, then it's going to make them more frightened. Mm-hmm. So then when it gets to be their turn, it's not going to be any better. So you kind of have an an obligation to look after yourself, but also act as a role model for those that you love if you want them to be able to experience things differently. 
Well, that's part of the reason I've done this YouTube series and I've been offering education so that we soften the fear and we have these heartfelt, informative conversations ahead of time. So you're not overwhelmed by the emotion in the moment. And you can maybe have some, you find out what you know, you find out because you people don't know what they don't know. So if mm-hmm. the conversations are offered ahead of time, it can be really helpful, right? Yeah, so. I say so to me, it's just health literacy. Right. So you brought up a point, though, too, as things are unfolding with di- diagnosis and prognosis, you talk about bringing a companion along. How important is that during the receiving of the news mm-hmm. and, the, and the testing? Well, I guess it depends a little bit on the circumstances and on the individual. Some people are quite private and would actually prefer to be on their own and, and have time uh, to talk privately to the person who's delivering a diagnosis. Uh, and maybe they have the health literacy to actually understand the language. But for anybody who is not comfortable with that, um, then I think having a good companion is helpful. Having a bad companion is probably worse than having no companion at all. Mm. Somebody that is highly emotional and um, doesn't know you very well, you know, those are probably two situations where it wouldn't be helpful. Or somebody who has their own agenda. Uh, but uh, but I think if you have a good companion that you trust, um, then anytime you hear anything which might be complicated, uh, it's always a good idea to have another pair of ears just so that you can have somebody to say, did she really say that? Mm-hmm. Or, you know, when she said that, what did, what did I say? I can't remember, mm-hmm. you know. So unless you record it, it's kind of nice to have that extra pair of ears just so you can go back over it and relive it and make sure that what you heard was really what was said. Mm -hmm. Um, But, um, you know, I don't think it's essential to have a companion, uh, but it certainly is very helpful for many people. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so now the person's been given the diagnosis and they're aware that this is life threatening. Fears are going to come up around um, facing the unknown and facing death. And you have a chapter in the book to address that. How do you help people face those fears in the unknown? Well, the first question is to find out what the fear is, right? Um, because it may not be what we think it is. It, um, I find that when you ask people about what it is about their future that they're frightened of, if anything, um, most people say they're not frightened of being dead, but they're frightened of what will happen to them on the way. Mm-hmm. And they also don't want to be a burden on their loved ones. So this, this is a really good starting point. Because then, I mean, some people are actually frightened of dying, the actual dying process. Not very many, but some people are really frightened of what happens. And often it comes with a a longstanding belief in heaven and hell Mm. and the fear of going to hell. Um, Though people don't have to be religious to have that fear. It can be a a non-religious fear that death is a horrible place to be and that there is some sort of lived experience of being dead, which is an unpleasant experience. I don't know where that comes from. I, I guess it's just from, from re- history mil- over the millennia. Uh, the concept of hell is, is, has become more than just part of a religion. So for those people that are actually frightened of the process of dying, I find that talking to them about near-death experience research is extremely helpful. So go, going through as close to pos- as possible what it actually is like to die is relaying what the research tells us about near-death experiences, which are incredibly common. Okay? And the vast majority are very positive. Most people who are resuscitated, who have consciousness afterwards enough to be able to report the experience, they say they, it was a wonderful feeling and they didn't want to come back. Or if they, if they were dragged back because of responsibilities. Mm-hmm. So um, Talking about near-death experiences, I find to be quite helpful for those who are uh, the ones that are particularly frightened of the dying process. The rest of the people, um, when we we can talk about the fears, and it's not helpful to just locate somebody and say, they're there, it'll be fine. Because everybody knows it's not going to be fine. Mm -hmm. And they just think, well, if the the doctor's not willing to talk about it, it must be really scary. It must be even worse than I thought. So I break it down and I say, okay, well, this is the kind of cancer you have. when, if this cancer progresses, these are a few of the things that could happen. You know, so I'll use an example of um, lung cancer. Um, number one, um, you might die from hypercalcemia, which is quite a common complication of lung cancer. 
when you get hypercalcemia, that's when the levels of uh, salt or calcium build up in the blood um, and you, you don't pee it out as fast as it's coming in or being generated from dissolving of your bones. Um, and it, it, what happens is it just gradually makes you more and more drowsy. Uh, there may be periods of confusion, but in the end, um, it's just you get more and more sleepy and you spend more of, more of the time sleeping and then one morning you don't wake up. And it's painless and it's actually a very pleasant way to go. So that's number one. Um, number two, there is a possibility that you might get very short of breath um, and not have enough lung. And even with oxygen, you might have problems with your breathing or become very short of breath. And if that happens, we have really good medications that can deal with that. So we're not saying it's not going to happen. People say, oh, I'm terrified of dying, suffocating. Well, as long as we know that you're short of breath, then we can deal with it. Mm -hmm. So you, you take the fear and then give them a strategy to deal with it and cope so that then the fear is still there, but it's much less. You've kind of addressed it. Um, there might be something else that would be happening if you have somebody who has a tumor that's right near a major artery and they're coughing up little bits of blood. You can say there is a small possibility that you, it might go into an artery and you might die from blood loss. I mean, dying from um, hemoptysis or you know, coughing up blood is, is particularly unpleasant, uh, but it does happen rarely. And some people may have heard about it or, or even seen it if they'd had relatives die from lung cancer and of a similar type. So talking about uh, if this happens, this is what we need to do. The good thing is it's painless. It's quick. The main issue is distressed relatives because there's a lot of blood. And so you need to be prepared by having things like a big bag of dark towels mm. and a big black plastic bag and some gloves. And so when it happens, you just put it all in there. Have it ready. Have it sitting I don't know, in the cupboard under the stairs or um, behind the, the vacuum cleaner or something in the bedroom, wherever the patient is spending most of the time. And so if it does happen, this is what you do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, I think that's probably the most important thing to do is address the fears one by one and don't give um, platitudes because mm -hmm. those are helpless. But they're really useless. Mm -hmm. Well, and again, I mean, I just thank you for that because I've seen people even come from other parts of the hospital or being afraid in home and then watched a team come in and just say, oh, that bit, oh, no, we have this that can help you or, oh, that bit, we, and it's an art, palliative care is this art, but people don't get to see what we see, mm -hmm. how you take each thing and then say, okay, well, that's uncomfortable right now, but this is these are the tools we have to help mm -hmm. make that comfortable and give you the gift of, of, you know, settling the pain and having you comfortable so you can enjoy the moments that you're, you're here and with the family too. Mm -hmm. So, so it's beautiful to watch, but again, people don't always know that those tools are available and, and you have a range of things and years like increasing of, weekly almost. Oh, yeah. years we're getting, we're of experience. Better better. Yeah. So there's the gift in itself too, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And it is, it is not straightforward medicine that you'd think, I mean, it, to me, it seems like it's not rocket science. It seems straightforward, but it's not been well taught historically in medical schools and nursing schools, particularly mm -hmm. in nursing schools. It's been very, very weak in the undergrad um, curriculum. Um, though we are trying to do the best we can with the undergrad curricula now, um, it's still not knowledge which is considered commonplace, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not rocket science and can be learned quite easily by anybody. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of courses and lots of resources which are available that can give people those skills without having to go and spend you know, four years in university. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's different levels of specialty, but many people can get to a pretty good level of competence without having to do a whole lot of formal training. But when things get complicated, that's when you want somebody who has had, you know, uh, uh, years of formal training and qualifications. So there, mm -hmm. there is definitely a role for having at least some palliative care specialists. They're never going to have enough palliative care specialists for everybody to have access to one uh, for routine care. But for people, when it gets complicated, everybody should have access to a specialist for the more complicated situations. Well, my husband was an example of that. He had three primary cancers and it was a rare situation. It went into the marrow in his spine. And honest to goodness, I can't imagine 
partnering someone without a palliative care team there. They were brilliant, <laughs> invested, and it was unique to them, but they just, they put their hearts and souls into it in a way that I get emotional even thinking about the dedication <laughs> of the team because they were thrown a really complex situation and they just invested all they could in it. So it's, it's touched my life in profound ways too, right? So, yeah. And it's so, I mean, it's real, really fun to do that. I love it. <laughs> Being able to go into a, an awkward situation where there's a lot of distress and then be able to relieve it, even if it's only some of it, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's incredibly satisfying. Mm -hmm. Well, and his was unique and ended up teaching them things they didn't know. So I know <laughs> that's his legacy too, that will help people in the future, right? So, so getting to the next thing you people have found out about this diagnosis and you talk about sharing the news how important is it for sharing the news? And you have an acronym SPIKE too that you highlight in the writing. Yes, and that was developed by um, actually an oncologist from the UK called Robert Buckman, um, mm -hmm. who uh, then came to Toronto. He was, I think he was a pediatric oncologist, if I remember rightly. Uh, but um, he was an amazing communicator and very funny man. He was quite involved with the early footlights in, in Cambridge, you know, the people that sort of went on to be Monty Python. That, that, oh, yeah. those, that seems part of that sort of um, group. Anyway, just really, really great guy. And, and he developed this mnemonic uh, because he repeatedly saw people having bad news revealed to them in a very, um, not heartless way, but in a way that was not easy to digest. And so he came up with this acronym called SPIKES, which is um, setting... So making sure that the setting is appropriate, you're not sort of having telling somebody something whilst they're vomiting into a bucket or, mm -hmm. or you know, or in a corridor mm -hmm. uh, where there's no room or space or privacy. So setting um, perception, P for perception. So first of all, finding out what people know um, so that you're approaching it from the same point. Because if you start with assumptions, you're often going to be wrong. Um, I for invitation. Is this a time that now that does this person feel that they can receive some bad news. Mm. So part of the invitation is kind of like a shot across the bows. I have mm. something important I need to talk to you about. Would you rather that your husband was here? Or um, do you need to go to the bathroom? Because if you do, go now, because we need to talk about this for a while. Um, is there any, are you comfortable? Can I get you a drink of water or anything? Okay, so the invitation, maybe that not that they don't want to hear, but they don't want to hear right then. And you, there are often easy things you can do to, uh, to make that better. So setting, perception, invitation, then knowledge. So mm -hmm. that's the K. So you break the news. I'm really sorry to have to tell you this, but we did get the result of your ski CT scan. And it does show that you um, have um, bowel cancer or something like that. Or the breast cancer you had five years ago, unfortunately, has metastasized to your bones. You know, then and you pause. Okay, and allow time or emotion. So it's E, E for emotion or empathy. So just give it time to sink in and, and allow expression of emotion. Um, and then the last S again is strategy. So, okay, where do we go from here? So setting invitation, so setting perception invitation knowledge, empathy, and strategy. So the strategy might be, um, I, you know, maybe I'll give you, you know, five minutes and I'll come back and, and have a chat with you again. Or would you like me to come back tomorrow? Or would you like me to come back again and um, I meet your, your daughter? Or, okay, the next step is we're going to make a referral to the oncologist and, um, you know, we'll let you know as soon as we have an appointment for you. Or we need to get some more tests. I'm going to send you to the lab for these particular tests, which will help us decide how best to treat your particular kind of cancer. Mm -hmm. Well, and bridging to that for the person themselves, I mean, in some cultures, they don't often talk about the prognosis. It's just a part of their, you know, in, I worked in a city where there's a lot of South Asian people from India and, and just giving a prognosis wasn't part of sort of their belief. And so it was interesting art for the doctors to work with, with mm -hmm. honoring that and then in integrating, you know, an awareness for the patient. But 
But what about somebody who says, well, I don't want to tell anybody because I think it would be really hard for them to hear this. Like, what are the advantage of sharing the news with friends and family versus not sharing? But again, it's unique to any one individual and it depends what their coping style has been throughout their life. You know, people tend to die as they have lived. And if you live a disorganized, lonely life, you're at risk of having a disorganized, lonely death. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to change somebody's coping strategies. If if their coping strategy all through their life has been hitting the bottle, then they're going to hit the bottle. You know, it's not helpful, but they don't know what else to do. And it's always worked for them. Mm -hmm. It's worked for them. So that's why they keep doing it. So you have to gauge it to the individual. And obviously, we would assume that if somebody is um, is distressed, it would be helpful to them to have other people be able to help them. If nobody knows what they're going through, they're not going to be able to help. Um, so practical things, emotional support, financial, there's lots of benefits in people being aware. But for some individuals, they, they're not comfortable with that. So you, you can't force what we think we would like onto another individual who maybe does things in a different way. Like some people, in, uh, particularly in, in some of the, uh, like the Chinese um, communities, um, there's a sort of perception that um, if you tell somebody that they have cancer, that they'll give up or they won't be able to cope. And I've had numerous occasions where I've been, you know, a patient's been referred to me at the BC Cancer Agency or BC Cancer, the big sign over the door, you know, <laughs> it says cancer everywhere in the building. Um, and they come in and the family is saying, don't tell, don't tell granddad he has cancer. And then I'll say, hi, Mr. Chan or whatever. Um, tell me, uh, what did you think you were, um, we were going to achieve today? Like, what, tell, me, tell me what your perception is of, of what we're going to do, often through the translator. And more often not, they say, well, I think I have cancer, but they won't let me talk about it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, they're trying to protect oh, each I, other in a way. Yeah, yeah. there's, there's oh. the elephant in the room. So, right. so I, I mean... I also have had a couple of patients who've had severe long-standing psychiatric problems with mm. chronic suicidality and major psychotic episodes. And of course, in that situation, you have to handle things very differently. And there may be patients in whom you have to have a very different approach. But most of the time, I find using that spikes mnemonic, uh, making sure that the, the setting is appropriate, uh, making sure that the patient is open to having a conversation. Um, and that the family that are being very protective have heard the patient say, I do want to talk about this, then it would be harmful for them to withhold that. Once they realize that by withholding, they're harming their loved one, then it helps them move to the fact that they do need to allow the patient to ask questions. And if you just respond to the questions and don't hit them over the head with it, you know, the patient's in denial, they've got to know that they're dying, you know, that's not helpful at all. So you have to just meet the patient where they're coming from. Uh, and I find that over time, generally, people do get their heads around it. And even if they choose not to talk about it, they generally, generally they do know and they do understand. Mm-hmm. Well, I just honor that you're honoring the uniqueness of each person and they're taking in and integrating that news and dealing with it in the mm-hmm. in the best way they know how, right? So mm-hmm. even if family wants them to be in a different place for them to be settled in the conversation, each has to, well, there's an invitation for each to kind of learn what's happening with the other and, you know, work together in their own pace and in their own way. Right. So. Exactly. And remember each, each person in the room is a patient really. And each of them will have their own individual coping strategies. Mm-hmm. Um, you, some you mean which fa- quite family too you're talking about. yeah exactly so exactly. you've got multiple patients <laughs> for that <laughs> communication <laughs> challenge um, right. and recognizing that people have coping strategies that may or may not seem dysfunctional to you but mm. uh, but they have to be acknowledged and trying to offer coping strategies that are more productive can be really helpful um, mm. that's one of the reasons why we we uh, Gaby and I wanted to and make the book available is because there's only so much time that you have in a professional interaction. Um, and there's so much content information that we wanted to deliver to our patients, but we didn't have time and they maybe weren't in the right headspace at that particular moment in order to receive that information. So by being able to have stuff in a book, 
especially when it's done chronologically. So the, the problems and the issues that people face at diagnosis time, as opposed to near the end of life, are, are somewhat different. So it allows people to get that information at their own pace when they're ready for it. And that concept of readiness is quite important. So people don't feel the need to hopefully read the whole thing from start to finish. So some people do. Some people just pick it up and they work through it as time goes by. And learning about near-death experiences may be something that one particular individual goes straight to. The others will stop at travel and say, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and then I'm, and let's talk about living wakes. I'm going to have a party you know, right. and leave all the stuff about funerals and stuff until later. But then other people, that may be their main focus. You know, I have one, one really um, illustrative example, which I, I found was a wonderful learning experience. It's a, a lovely lady um, who was diagnosed with an, an incurable cancer. This is quite a long time ago. Um, and she was actually quite well. She didn't have any symptoms. Um, she had had some treatment. It seemed to have been moderately effective. We didn't know how long it would be before her cancer would recur. But there was a possibility, strong possibility, that ability that eventually she would die from it. So we we spent forty minutes talking about you know her various issues or or lack thereof um, and chatting really. And then at the end, they said, I, "I feel like I haven't really helped you today. Is there anything that that we've missed talking about?" She said, "Well." What I really wanted to know is I have to decide whether to pay extra for a lead lining in a coffin or not. Can you tell me whether worms get through wood or not? <laughs> and does it matter what wood it's like? If it's pine, is that okay? Or should it be the really expensive ones? Because I don't think I can really afford a big coffin. But on the other hand, I don't like the idea of my body lying there with worms coming into it. So I said, oh, okay, right. Well, let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. You know. And then in the end, she decided to be cremated and didn't have to worry about all that. Mm -hmm. and, and we were able to have a really great conversation because she actually said what she was worried about. Mm -hmm. So it was something that I hadn't, I, um, I hadn't had somebody ask me before, mm -hmm. but it was, uh, was really important for me as a learning exercise to always ask. And you can never anticipate what people are worried about. Well, and that's an interesting point too, because I remember recently I was looking at the 10 top fears and actually what happens to the body after death was on that list. Mm -hmm. Doesn't yeah, always that's why we have a chapter here in the yeah. Book. yeah. And so you've got a lovely chapter in the book honoring that and how how that can re like that's such a beautiful story to help her settle so she can deal with that fear. Beautiful example of that, right? Yeah, yeah. I had another lady who was very concerned about when she was going to die in Vancouver because she wanted to be transported back to Winnipeg to be buried and the ground's frozen certain mm -hmm. times of the year. Mm -hmm. So she needed to know so that she could prepare and have a plan for that. I don't know what they do there. I mean, presumably people have to be buried all year round. Maybe they pre-dig them in the fall or something. I don't know. But <laughs> there was stuff that she needed to do. Mm -hmm. And um, and she was able to have that conversation, even though she was still perfectly healthy. She was, she had a trap line. She was still going out and doing a trap line. Mm -hmm. You know, it was amazing. Interesting. So where did children, so you touch on children too, where did children fit into this conversation and how important is it to invite them in? You mean when uh, they have a parent? When the, when, uh, the when, news the is, when the news is being shared and someone in the family is ill, how do you invite the children into the conversation? Or should It depends up very much on the age and the developmental stage of the children. I mean, clearly toddlers and, you know, young teenagers, it would be best not to have them there for the initial breaking of the news uh, because, you know, they, the parents need to be allowed to express their emotion without fear of upsetting their children. Um, so most, most of the time, I think we would not have young children present. But if you have adult children, um, then it's very helpful often to have them present because then they can um, they can hear like we were saying before about being another witness. You've got another pair of ears, another pair of eyes. So then, when they get home and they say, "Well, what did she say?" Then you can have um, more people remembering. So you're more likely to remember it right if you do it collectively. Mm -hmm. But small children, um, then you know that's much more Gaby's uh, area of expertise than than mine. Uh, but certainly, children are. Um, it's very important they are made aware of what is happening and to have a parent die suddenly without an opportunity to say goodbye can be very confusing and distressing for a child and can, can traumatize them for, you know, for many years. So it's very important for parents of young children to try to, to try to make sure that they leave some form of 
legacy for them, not in in money, I I mean in in memories. So not just, again, living memories because they can fade over time and young children particularly may not remember things when they're older. So providing substitutes for living memories, such as uh, videos, letters, sound recordings, things like that, photographs, scrapbooks, cuddly toys made of your your clothes, um, books, you know, photo books. There's there's so many things that people can do to ensure that um, a child, when they grow up, has something meaningful to to read and see so that they feel that they really knew who their parent was. Well, and and you actually referred to Lumera and Camp Carey, Dr. Heather Mowen's work (laughs) in the Vancouver area, and I just did a recording with her. Oh, great. on children, teen, and family grief. So it's a wonderful interview or conversation for people to look at if they want mm-hmm. to know more information about that. Because, you know, as you say, and for children, all the developmental stages have an effect on how they're able to receive the news and integrate it, right? So, mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. Okay, so, know. so where do I, now, sudden death can happen and we end up in the ER or ICU as with COVID, but if we can plan, where do you, do, like, is it home? Is it hospice? And what are the advantages or disadvantages of different places to, to plan to die? How do you support? Again, that's, it goes back to the individual, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. You're probably just about to say that. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, yeah, well, and, and, and it is like, cause I hear so many people say, well, well I want to have a home death. But then when they dig down deeper into what does that, like my husband, we ain't, we had him at home for months in a hospital bed and the friends were coming and it was the goal. But then the pain got so complex that to attend to it, he ended up in a, with an epidural line that it ended up so complex that he ended up on a palliative unit. And for me, even as the wife, that was more of a relief because it was getting mm. complicated at home. So can you speak to that choice and how you support people to look at the options and what that actually truly involves when, when you're working to support that individual for the dream of where they might want to end up and what the options are? I guess the first point to make is that not everybody has the choice. Mm. Um, not everybody has access to a residential hospice of freestanding hospice. Not everybody has access to a palliative care unit at their regional hospital. Not everybody has access to specialist palliative care nurses. But assuming that you have access to all of those, which is a relatively small part of British Columbia, um, and outside of BC, uh, there, there are some areas where it's even, even poorer. Um, I think that it's important to recognize that every patient will have something that feels right for them at different points in time. Mm-hmm. There it, are can of, cha- it can change. It can change. Yeah. You can so, have an initial goal and then things you didn't expect unfold. And so then it has to be yeah. reevaluated, right? So. Yeah. So there's, there's two conditions which is tough to do, deal with at home. So that if you look at the actual illness, people that have severe shortness of breath, that often requires oxygen, and it's hard to have have that sufficiently um, installed in the home. Um, you'd often need a respiratory therapist, um, and you need access to medications, which need often to be given by injection rather than orally. So number one, severe shortness of breath. People are often much more comfortable if they're in a hospital environment with 24-hour nursing with that. The other one is delirium. Um, delirium or confusion. Um, and some people, if they have metastases to the brain or they have some other metabolic disturbance, they might develop a, a, de- a delirium where they become quite agitated and they may not be aware of their surroundings. Um, sometimes they may even become a danger to themselves. They might try to you know, pull out their IVs or pull out a catheter or get out of bed when they know they can't stand and end up falling and breaking a hip. And, you know, when they're the confusion is a, a, an impediment to them receiving safe care. Those are the situations where it's better to put, um, put somebody into a safer environment until such time as the delirium can be you know, addressed, if, if, it, if it has been able to be addressed. Usually there's a cause or multiple causes, most of which can be treated. And so often people can have an episode of delirium, go into hospital, and then they deal with it, and they get clear again, then they're able to go home again. So delirium, 
and dyspnea or shortness of breath are two that are medical conditions that are tough. There are also the patient-related factors. Somebody who lives alone mm -hmm. um, or in a single-room occupancy hotel on the downtown east side of Vancouver or 45 kilometers at the end of a gravel road in winter, you know, with only a, a wood stove mm -hmm. that needs to be fed all the time and, and nobody there with them. Now, these are situations where the patient's actual medical issues may be very straightforward, but there's just no practical way that you could deliver that kind of care uh, with the resources that are available in that situation. Um, we have some large regional hospitals, like Kelowna General Hospital, doesn't have a palliative care unit. Mm. You know, it's the biggest hospital in the Okanagan area, and, um, and there's no palliative care unit. But they do have two part-time palliative care consultants now, new, um, just recently added, who could come and help the staff on that, uh, on the particular surgical ward or medical ward or wherever gynae ward that the, uh, the patient is on that would be able to provide that service. So you, you kind of have to use the resources you have available depending on where you are. Um, I think personally, I would be happy to live in a hospice for my last end of part of end of life. In certain circumstances, obviously, I'd like to live at home until I died, if that was possible. Uh, but um, I would, if things got got a bit tough and I needed special support, specialist help, then I would prefer to be in a hospice. But that everybody's different. Yeah, everyone's uh, different, and yeah. and it and it depends, as you say. Are you alone? Some people want to be alone as they go through it, but then there's others, they're alone and that causes a lot of fear. So who are the friends and family that can support you if you're at home? And if there isn't enough resource, they're looking at the other options, you know, in your area. And pe your people might want to have a temporary admission, like palliative care units. They, a lot of people go into palliative care to get problems sorted. It's an acute hospital. Mm -hmm. um, so you go in, you get sorted, you go home again. You can't go home again, then you go from PCU to hospice. People go mm -hmm. into hospice and go home again. Mm -hmm. Sometimes then the, the hospice staff are able to sort people out and get their health so much better that they can then be discharged. There's something like a 10% discharge rate from hospice. So mm -hmm. not everybody dies in hospice. It's not just well, a one-way door. There's your bow tie again. You yeah, know? exactly. Like it's yeah. not a direct, It's and people don't see that. They hear the words and think it's an endpoint, but it's actually oh. more fluid than people realize, right? Yeah, so. a lot of people get so much better when they go to hospice, especially if they have been relatively isolated. You know, having people feed you regularly, keep you warm, um, love you, you know, mm -hmm. have contact, human contact, um, and, and good medical care. Often people who look like they're dying are actually dying of neglect. Um, or mm -hmm. self-neglect. And then when they are cared for, they get substantially better. Mm -hmm. Like one patient went into hospice and then he, he got so much better, he, he ended up getting a dog and oh. bought a car and, um, and was there <laughs> for months and then they ended up having to discharge him. Mm -hmm. Well, and I even, when I worked as the program director for a hospice society at a near Vancouver, there were, I remember a few times people who had lived on the streets were admitted and oh my god like they felt that they had gone to heaven like they had mm, this warm bed awesome. people giving them foot massages being fed mm. well they sometimes like you know they had tears in their eyes saying this is the most loved I've ever felt it in my life and yeah. see I even get thinking of yeah. those patients. but isn't that sad isn't it sad, sad. you have to be you have to be dying to yeah. their perceptions why did I have to be dying to get this you know yeah. that's not right and that's why I think this early this awareness that everybody should be treat, treated well um, and the palliative approach to care is just a good whole person care attention to detail and um, to meeting the patient where they're coming from asking what their concerns there are what mm -hmm. are their fears what are their issues and trying to deal with them rather mm -hmm. than saying, well, this is what we got, take it or leave it, which is mm -hmm. unfortunately what often happens. Mm -hmm. um, hospice is only for people who have less than a six month life expectancy. And if you live six months and one day, then there's something wrong. Why didn't you mm -hmm. die? You know, mm -hmm. there's a feeling that people are going to be experiencing that. But in reality, that doesn't happen at all. Mm -mm. It's way more fluid mm -hmm. and adaptable and, and, mm -hmm. And, you know, we're just giving examples of the gifts received and how it's enhanced their living and their life, right? And, and, and those being, around them. Yeah, and being seen and loved. So then those around them, the caregiver, I'm glad that in the book, you also honor the caregiver and ask to, you know, pay attention to the, 
to the experience of the caregiver as well, because sometimes the caregiver, often the caregiver is forgotten or not seen and honored mm-hmm. in the role to the depth. So, yeah, the book is directed at the patient mm-hmm. um, and the chapter on the caregiver is directed to how the patient can improve the quality of life of the caregiver to try to flip the roles rather than the patient being seen as a burden, having the patient being uh, being feel feeling empowered to improve the life of their caregiver mm-hmm. um, and how much they can give, which is, I think is important. People, when they're in the role of being cared for, they don't realize how much they give in allowing themselves to be cared for. It's an enormous gift to mm-hmm. their loved one. And to, to not be allowed to care for somebody that you love is, is a real slap in the face and, and can be very hard. Um, so knowing how to accept care is really important. So we, we try to empower the patients in that um, in that respect as well. Mm-hmm. well. I remember years ago being involved in a filming of a short film for the provincial organization for hospice palliative care to educate people. And one of the clinical nurse specialists says, don't ever forget that the number one team is the patient and the caregiver or the patient and the family. Mm-hmm. And that's who we're coming around, right? So we don't want to neglect that person who's mm-hmm. who's devoted to the individual at end of life too. Mm-hmm. Um, there's so many questions I am looking at the time and you've, that I had a series of questions you've touched on already about a bucket list, you know, looking at the wishes and things to do at end of life, uh, living, living wake and legacy work. I mean, you to touch beautifully on legacy work around children. So families can go forward with stories and, and, um, an awareness of that life. Do you want to just talk a little bit about bucket list and travel? Because I know sometimes people are have a goal, I, especially in the hospice I worked in, there were a lot of people who came from other countries. Mm. And then as the illness was progressing, they were still determined to travel. So how do you support people who want to do those bucket lists? I'm going to embrace life mm. in every stage of the illness here. Um to follow through with that dream or wish? Because people yeah. sometimes think, oh, I can't do it. But they forget to even ask the doctor, is this mm-hmm. even possible? Mm-hmm. Exactly. It's, again, it's back to the same thing. Talk to the patient mm-hmm. and find out what their fears, what their wishes are. And if somebody wants to do something, then you can often make things happen um, that you would have not thought would be being possible. For example, um, some cruise ships have... Dialysis, they're dialysis cruises, mm-hmm. so they'll employ a dialysis technician and they'll have a, a row of dialysis machines and they'll advertise it as people on dialysis can still go on holiday because basically they can take the dialysis with them. Um, people on total parenteral nutrition where they have a, a, a tube and their feed is a liquid feed, a sterile feed that has to be mm-hmm. delivered fresh each day and, and it goes into the, uh, to the, the, the little... Um, Hickman catheter. Mm-hmm. And um, that can be also fixed up because people have TPN all around the world mm-hmm. and there are TPN providers all around the world. Mm-hmm. They just have to talk to each other. So if you want to fly to Spain and stay there for three months to you know, spend time with your granny, then you just have to find the appropriate Spanish service provider, make sure that they have the information on the particular recipe that has been determined to be the best for this particular individual. And then um, they, they take enough for the journey and then they switch to the new provider when they get there. And then when they come back, they just, everybody talks to each other and then we hook them up with the, their old provider as soon as they get home. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's probably not the end of the world if they have to just have sailing for a couple of days in, in transit. You know, people can live without food for a few days without any problems as long as they get fluids. So that's just one example of, of one particular patient I remember. Um, we had another one who was much more complicated. It was a young girl who had a spinal tumor and she had an implanted intrathecal pump. So had a a catheter that was embedded in the the tissues around the base of the spine and then an under the skin uh, reservoir with the drug and a a little motor and a pump in and a battery uh, underneath the skin in her abdominal wall. So it was all inside her and it just needed to be refilled once a month or so. And she wanted to go to Iran to spend mm-hmm. time with with family and um, and so my colleague in uh, at St Paul's who uh, was the one who had put the, the pump in and was operating it 
he contacted a colleague in Iran hmm. and we just set it all up that when she got there, he would do the refills and then she would come home and she was able to be there for quite a few months. See, um, no, yeah. So that just, is, you can just do it. You just do but it. You see, that's another beautiful example of palliative care and whole person yeah. care. The team is saying, what do, what do you want to do to embrace your life? Yeah. To the last breath. And we know there's some limitations here, but how can we support you to work with those, but still engage in life and follow and, and, you know, celebrate your dreams. That's a mm. beautiful example of it. Yeah. People want to help. We had another one, a chap who went, who wanted to sail down to Mexico. And so we got his pharmacist to make up multiple little packages dried so that they were sealed. There was no way that his medication would go off. So being able to actually give the patient dried powder, which you would not normally do, but the pharmacist did it. He weighed them all out and had all these little packages and all labeled and sent him off to have his, have his um, journey by because he didn't have a fridge. You know, I mean, there's, there's little things like that. People love to be able to help. And, and if you speak to, um, uh, you know, somebody in a hotel, you have special needs. Remember when our, our son came, first came home from hospital, our, our second one, he was on oxygen and we really wanted to have a, a weekend break. So we, we asked the oxygen company if they could deliver oxygen to a, a motel in Seashell. We spoke to the motel. We said, is it okay if the home oxygen people come and deliver it the day before so that when we get there, it'll be all ready to go. And, and they said, oh, yeah, no problem, of course. Mm -hmm. So we traveled with a small child on oxygen with a tank that only lasted four hours, and we just went from one to the other mm -hmm. seamlessly. Mm -hmm. And you, you just you didn't, nobody charged us anything either. It was mm -hmm. all free. It was mm -hmm. absolutely incredible. So find out what you want to do. Find out what the specific obstacles are for that individual, and then just problem solve. And mm -hmm. Sometimes you can't make it all work. I mean, sometimes people's expectations are, are unfortunately a little too high and, and it's not possible, but it's amazing what you can do. Mm -hmm. You know, quadriplegics can go to Machu Picchu. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I'm a licensed glider pilot and there used to be a program where we would have quadriplegics or paraplegics come and there would be a seasoned glider pilot in the back and the quads, especially we'd have a way to put them in the, into the glider and they would go up. It would be a dream or a wish of theirs. Mm -hmm. And that smiles coming down. Mm -hmm. We're just, and they it's said, real, yeah. they said, they said, felt a sense of freedom. They hadn't felt in, in years. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so it was insurance lovely. is, um, insurance is important. Um, and that is something that has been an issue. And we talk about that in, in the book and there mm -hmm. are um, some companies that offer different packages to regular insurance, which allow people with pre-existing conditions to still be able to travel with relative peace of mind, knowing that they could be transported home should they experience some sort of medical emergency while they're away, if it was related to their underlying condition. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously people who are very much in the last days of life, that wouldn't be really possible for. Mm -hmm. But people who are living well with illness, um, there's no reason to not travel because of not being able to get conventional travel insurance because there are these flexible options uh, that are available. Mm -hmm. Again, it's in, it's, uh, the details are in the book. I'm not going to talk about specific companies uh, here. <laughs> well, and I'm also looking at the time, and there's so much in the book. I mean, but you have a, a chapter on living wakes and how to celebrate a life, you know, and, and as I said, legacy work and bucket list ideas. So the book is a phenomenal um, resource for people to look at, just to even start to think about those kind of things, how they can celebrate with family. And, and near-death experiences and deathbed visions and dreams, you do touch on it. And what's so interesting, I did a, an interview with Dr. Bruce Grayson, 50 years research on near-death experiences and Dr. Christopher Kerr on deathbed visions and dreams. And those are the two most popular conversations and mm. I think they're important because they really do help people have a different perspective or even just be open and curious about other mm. perspectives and experiences so I'm, I'm I'm thrilled that you highlight that as well or invite that conversation so my last question it's a signature question I ask everyone you do such amazing work it's we're so blessed to have you in our region and all the foundational work you've done and the influence as a leader how has your heart been changed by this work over the years? My heart been changed. Well, I'd like to think it hasn't really been changed much at all, but that, that it was in decent shape to start with. <laughs> okay. 
Because it takes years. I mean, I, I, I developed a, an interest in palliative care before I knew what palliative care was. But, uh, like it hadn't really been invented then. I'm that old. <laughs> but I graduated from medical school in 1985. Mm -hmm. um, and really, you know, palliative care as a, um, as a concept wasn't really around until certainly the late 80s. So uh, it kind of grew with me. Um, and I realized that what I liked doing was happened to be called palliative care. Mm. Um, but seeing seeing patients have poor experiences with the healthcare system and with certain individual physicians really shaped me into wanting to make it better. Um, and I, I would love to say that it was examples of excellence, which made me want to be able to do be like that. But at the beginning, it was examples of appalling care. Mm -hmm. and terrible deaths that mm -hmm. I felt were unnecessary that made me mm -hmm. angry and made me want to make the system better. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess at the beginning, I perhaps had a little bit of a, of, of a sense of not, not quite being a crusader, but, but trying to right a wrong. Um, and then now it is an accepted form of medicine and um, form of nursing care and health of care is, is still very young, but it is evolving. I think I, I feel proud to have been able to have guided many of my junior colleagues to try to do better in the future so that there's less and less and less of those bad experiences. There's never going to be zero. There's always going to be bad things that happen and poor, poor interventions and inappropriate care. But I just want to try to, over the years, gradually make it less and less and less of those and more and more and more of the good experiences. Mm -hmm. um, so if when I retire, I, I hope I'll feel that I've done a decent job in, in trying to reach as many people as I can. Well, that's beautiful. And as I said, we're blessed to have you in our region as a leader because you've had great influence and Thank we've you, all bene benefited from that. It's in my best interest to make sure I've got to whip these young people into shape because they're going to be looking <laughs> after me when I'm old. <laughs> well, there you go. They better be yeah. doing it right, right? Yeah. So I want to mention your book title one last time for everyone who's watching. And we'll put the image of the front cover on for people to get its titled Lap of Honor. A No Fear Guide to Living Well with Dying. Oh, she's got it up there. Yeah, we'll put it also on the screen too. But Lap of Honor, A No Fear Guide to Living Well with Dying. And thank you so much for taking the time to coming to come and sit with me today. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. I don't get often uh, get time to talk about these, um, these thoughts. Um, and so good questions. Thank you. That's made me reflect quite well. So thank you. Thank you.